Good afternoon and welcome to our next session on South African birding destinations. My name is Andrew de Blanc. The African Bird Fair has been held in Johannesburg for the last 15 years. And although we've had tour guides and exhibitors join us from broader Africa, the bird lovers in attendance have been majority South African. We expect that many of them will be attending virtually again today. So we've decided to do a special feature on birding in South Africa. This will also be a great session to attend for anyone wanting to visit the country or anyone who's interested in finding out more about it. If this is not to your interest, there are concurrent sessions running right now on African birding destinations at the main feeder and a session highlighting some of Africa's best bird artists on feeder three. This session will highlight some of the best birding destinations and activities on offer at the southern tip of Africa. We will start with Duncan McKenzie in the Lofeld exploring the famous Kruger National Park before traveling across the country to explore the Western Cape with Dr. Dominic Rowlandson from Birding Ecotours. We then return to the Northeast and traverse KwaZulu Natal with Michael Wright from Sustained Safaris and Birding. We then head offshore with Neil Ferrance to look at Durban Pelagics before running down the coastline to end with a presentation on Cape Town Pelagics with Vince Wall. I hope you will enjoy these presentations and learn a lot along the way. Hello and welcome to this virtual tour through one of Africa's most famous birding spots, Kruger National Park, situated within the Lowfeld of South Africa. My name is Duncan McKenzie, long-time Lowfeld resident, and I'll be guiding you on a virtual birding safari through this diverse and interesting reserve. Despite being very popular with mammal and Sort of general wildlife safaris, mainly thanks to the so-called Big Five, thousands of guided or self-drive birding trips are run through the park each year, with the mammals of course as an added bonus. The Kruger National Park, or Kruger as we usually refer to it, is one of the easiest birding spots you can find anywhere in the world, with a large network of good roads linking comfortable rest camps through all the main birding habitats. Once you're outside of the camps, you're restricted to your vehicle, but this makes a great mobile hide from which to observe and photograph birds like these. Regular scenic viewpoints, hides and picnic sites are also scattered throughout the park and here you can stretch your legs and bird a little bit on foot. Bird photographers are especially fond of Kruger due to the presence of relatively habituated birds. There is no human hunting pressure in Kruger and many birds have lost their fear of man here. Apart from Kruger's location in the subtropical northeastern corner of South Africa, the diversity of bird life is also due to the diverse habitats present, each supporting a unique assemblage of birds. The camps provide ideal birding opportunity and are often situated adjacent to a river or lake uh, and contain tall trees. A quick overview of the park. It is the largest protected area in South Africa at just a shade under 20,000 square kilometers or 2 million hectares. It is just slightly smaller than Israel or Wales or Slovenia. Um, it has been designated as a global important bird and biodiversity area with 11 globally threatened species and 14 resident regionally threatened species. So this park is extremely important for the conservation and protection of threatened bird species. Let's have a quick look at the birds themselves. There have been over 530 species recorded to date this includes about 130 vagrants and localized residents, of which there are about 40 species. Localized meaning these birds only occur in a very small area of the park. 90% of South African bird orders are represented and 82% of Southern African bird families are represented. Obviously, uh, seabirds are not represented in Kruger. Importantly, 
there have been 57 species of diurnal raptors recorded in the park to date and of course Kruger is famous for its raptor sightings. So now we're going to go through a quick tour of the main habitat types, the four main habitat types in Kruger Park and highlight a few special birds in each. The savannah areas, this is the dominant habitat type uh, in the park and this is dominated by various tree species depending on your location in the park. This habitat contains the widest diversity of species and include many sort of typical uh, savannah or woodland species such as hornbills, uh, rollers, woodpeckers, shrikes, weavers and of course the very colorful waxbills. Some species with very restricted ranges in South Africa attract birders regularly and include the striking on its chat, African golden oriole and the noisy grey-necked uh, or brown-necked parrot, the elusive racket-tailed roller and the very elegant Dickinson's kestrel. Lucky birders can also find three-banded corsa, which favours the more arid woodlands up north. Next habitat type we're going to look at are wetlands and in Kruger these are mainly represented by rivers and temporary pans with a few marshes present as well. Common and conspicuous residents include African fish eagle and African jacana and all eight of southern Africa's storks are present. Some of the shyer migrants include greater painted snipe and dwarf bitten often inhabiting temporary habitats, temporary wetlands, while white crowned lapwing is a noisy resident of the larger sandy river beds. This bird in South Africa only occurs in the Kruger National Park. Two rare and sought after residents are Pals, Fishing Owl and African Finfoot, both near the top of the wetland specials in the Kruger. Grasslands are found mainly in the eastern half of Kruger in areas with shallow clay soils or down in the far southwest in deep granitic soils. Grasslands get progressively drier as one heads north uh, with a subtle change in the birds that are present as well. These areas support some of the larger birds in Kruger such as common ostrich and Cory Bustard which is one of the heaviest of all the flying birds in the world and of course raptors are conspicuous in this open environment and include many threatened species such as the martial eagle uh, and all the vultures including the white-headed vulture. The lack of cover means birds become slightly more cryptic in this environment and one often has to work a little bit harder for species such as larks, sand grass, pipits and cysticulus. Due to the seasonal abundance of food, the grasslands support some of the largest flocks of bird in, in Kruger, especially some of the migrant raptors such as steppe and lesser spotted eagle, um, and nomadic opportunists such as wattled starlings and red-billed quilias which occur in flocks ranging from hundreds to hundreds of thousands and of course as migratory raptors would take full advantage of this abundance of prey as well. Last habitat we're going to have a quick look at is riparian forest. Now this forest lines some of the larger rivers in Kruger. Uh, the low felt does not support the diverse forests of the adjacent Great Escarpment but riparian forest is home to a number of beautiful residents such as robin chats, turacos, various sunbirds, um, hornbills um, etc. Two species with very restricted distribution in South Africa are black-throated wattle eye and southern yellow white eye and these little birds 
can be looked for up north along the Livubu and the Lipopo rivers up near the border with Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Lucky birders may even bump into the stunning Marina Trogon or even the magnificent crowned eagle. As a package, the Kruger Park is an incredible birding destination, offers everything for visiting birders, accommodation, good roads, restaurants, great birding, and as I said, as a bonus, some of the big hairy scaries as well. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in Kruger. Hi, this is Dominic Robinson. I work for Birding Eco Tours, and I'll be chatting to you today about birding in the Western Cape of South Africa. So the Western Cape is really well known amongst birders, both locally and internationally, for the, for the large number of both Cape endemics and South African endemics, which can be seen fairly easily in the province. So in this short 10 minute talk, I'll be chatting to you about the, some of the birding, birding routes, which I suggest to, to visit to find these endemics. And uh, I've chosen Cape Rock Jumper as the title slide here, as it's probably the, um, the most highly prized and uh, charismatic of our Cape endemics. This is a nice male seen in Royals. So I'm gonna start off with the Cape Town area. So you hardly have to leave the city limits before you come across a number of these um, endemics or specials. So first off is Cape Sugarbird. So this bird can be seen on the slopes of Table Mountain. It's uh, not difficult to get a photograph like this set up, set up on a protea. And they really are very vocal and um, it's very easy birds to spot. So you can, often, you can see these on the slopes of Table Mountain along with orange-breasted sunbirds, but, uh, in my opinion, the prettiest of our South African sunbirds. And then if you head into the Kirstenbosch Botanical Garden, it's uh, you can't really miss Cape Spurfowl. They're, they're, they're very loud and, and noisy birds, and uh, they wander across the lawns and often try uh, try steal from from your picnic. Uh, so not not a difficult bird to find. Cape Siskin requires a little bit more effort, and um, if you hone in, hone into their contact cores, they're not difficult to find on the higher up on the slopes of Table Mountain. And uh, Cape Bulbul is a uh, again one of the, the commoner of the Cape endemics. So just most of the suburbs and um, suburban areas of um, Cape Town um, house these, uh, house these bu bubbles. Uh, and although not a Cape endemic, uh, southern double collared sunbird, it is a South African or South African Asutu endemic and um, very easy to see in areas such as Kirstenbosch or in any, any famous or forested area. Of course, I have to mention the African penguins. So these comical, comical birds can be seen down in Simon's Town um, at Boulder's Beach. And while you're down here, you should uh, make sure you look through the uh, cormorants. So there's three marine cormorants which occur here, which are endemic to Southern Africa. This is the bank cormorant, which is the rarest of the three. As, and then Cape cormorant and crown, the smallest of the three crown cormorant. And very similar to reed cormorant, but basically the marine, the marine version of reed cormorant. We then head a little bit further east out of the city into the Cape Fold Mountains, where we bird Roy Else in Betty's Bay. And here the big target is Cape Rock Jumper. So this is a female bird. I showed the male on the front slide, and uh, not too difficult to find, especially if you can uh, familiarize yourself with its high pitched chattering call. It often takes, once you've heard, once you've heard of a family group, it can take a bit of work to actually pick one out, but um, given enough time, you should be able to find them. Royals is, is probably the best spot for them nowadays. And then if you, if you bird some of the, the famed boss thickets, you can search for Vic Victorin's warbler. You have to learn its call, and then once you find its call, they're not too difficult to, to track down. They are very much a skulking species, but they do often pop out and, and give you good looks like this bird. And then if you head a little bit further inland into the, um, and bird the, the mountainous areas and the uh, protea strewn slopes, this is protea canary. So one of the tougher Cape, Cape endemics, 
uh, but if you know where to look, um, you should be able to pick them out. And uh, not, not a Cape endemic, but a South African and Lesotho endemic. Uh, this is ground woodpecker. Uh, Royals is a very good spot for them, especially if you go in the morning, you can see family groups sat out on the boulders catching the early morning light. Uh, and again, in these um, mountainous areas, we look for sentinel rock thrush and Cape rock thrush. Heading a little bit further east, um, across the Overberg and into the Agulhas Plains. So in late winter and early spring, you get these beautiful um, uh, canola field blossoms, uh, bright yellow fields, and uh, it's these canola fields and wheat fields, which we bird for things such as blue crane, which is a South African national bird. And this is probably their stronghold out in the Agulhas Plains. Uh, and then a number of lark species, so Gullis Longboard Lark and Cape Clapper Lark. So um, outside of the breeding season when the, male, when, the, oh, when the males are displaying with their, um, their flight displays, they're almost impossible to find. And uh, <coughs> so you really have to bird late, um, late winter, early spring for these uh, clapper larks. And I'd say the toughest of the Cape endemics is the Hottentot button quail. So you really have to organize a, a flush, so you get a, a bunch of people to walk the field and hopefully put, put one of these birds up. Um, unless you flush them, you have very little chance of seeing these birds. There are a couple known spots for these birds. Uh, if you head a little bit further south now towards the coast, like in the Hoop Nature Reserve, there's a, there's a colony of cave vultures. And then if you bird the thickets for things such as Southern Chagra, Niza Woodpecker, and then if you head a little bit further north into areas such as Hrudfadersbos, you can pick out Nasa Warbler, which is a very much a skulking species. And sadly, they no longer seem to occur on the Cape Peninsula, um, possibly because of the bush being cleared. Uh, there used to be a few pairs around uh, Kersenbosch, but um, sadly not anymore. So now heading up the west coast uh, is the next birding uh, roots I'm going to discuss, so well known for its floral displays in, in uh, spring. Uh, Black Harrier is our big target up here and not too difficult to find. We also look out for Southern Black Corhorn. Greywing Franklins are fairly common in West Coast National Park. Head up a little bit further north to um, Friedenburg area, we bird the farmlands for Cape Longboard Lark, little um, fame, uh, strandfold patches for Cape Pendulum Tits. And then the coastal areas where African oyster catcher is pretty common. And uh, more, more um, of interest to the Southern African birders, uh, every year one or two Australian gannets pitch up in the Cape Gannet colonies. And you can see that's the bird on the right, is the Australasian gannet. We head to the salt works at um, Chester, uh, sorry, at uh, Thaltrith to look for Chester banded plover and redneck phalarope, which um, have pretty much a curve year round now. It's not an easy bird in South Africa, but this is definitely the best spot for them. And then if we head to the coast, such as at Jakob's Bay, St. Helena Bay, there's um, Antarctic terns, which appear, uh, appear here every winter. And if we head a little bit further inland, we, um, we get into the Tankwood Crew, which is a semi-desert environment and houses a number of, of, um, of South African endemics. So a number of lark species, such as Karoo lark, large board lark is pretty common. Uh, Karoo long board lark, if you head a little bit further north into the tankway, you can see these, um, these species. And um, also uh, the, probably the toughest of the tankway birds, or one of the toughest is a black-eared sparrow lark, very much a nomadic species, so it's either there or it's not. Um, and uh, can be very difficult to photograph. Uh, we, we try the uh, rock strewn slopes for a similar breasted warbler, the, um, the dry river beds or, or Phragmites reeds for the macro warbler, uh, also Lael's warbler, which is formerly the Lael's tip babbler, and the cute little fairy flycatcher. We bird the, the more open plains for things like Karoo, uh, sorry, Karoo Korhan, which we like often locate by its frog-like um, duet. Uh, Ludwig's Bustard is another nomad and can be tough to locate, as well as Birchall's Corsa. This is one of the, the tougher birds. 
So that, that's a very brief um, overview of, of birding in the Cape. And I just wanted to quickly talk about my company, the company I work for, Birding Eco Tours. So um, we specialize in small group and custom made birding and wildlife tours. We do trips to all, all seven of the continents. So if you're looking for Shubo in Uganda, Snow Petrel in, uh, or on an Antarctic cruise, Dear Dend Sandpiper Plover in the, in the Andes, or Southern Cassowary in, in Australia. We'd, we'd really uh, love to have you, have you along. So please do get in touch. And thank you for listening. Birding in the species rich region of KwaZulu Natal. Wow, what a topic to be sharing with you today. KwaZulu Natal is host to 76% of South Africa's bird species. Wow, now that should grab your attention. Hello, good day, and a warm welcome from me, Michael Wright of Sustained Safaris, to all the attendees of today's African Bird Fair from all around the world. And a very warm welcome from the Zulu Kingdom. I'm going to be sharing a presentation with you now and I uh, hope you enjoy it and as you follow along with me and you learn a whole lot about Kozulu Natal. So here goes. Kozulu Natal is the third smallest of the nine provinces of South Africa, yet it is host to 651 of South Africa's 854 species, over 50 of Southern Africa's 68 endemic or near endemic species, 29 of the country's important bird areas, two world heritage sites, and the holy grail of the country's birding hotspots. This amazing province should be at the very top of every tourist birding tourist bucket list when visiting and exploring Southern Africa. Despite KwaZulu Natal covering an area of only 94,000 square kilometers, which is a mere 7.7% of the country's landscape, what it lacks in size, it more than makes up for an extraordinary bird diversity. The unmatched species richness on offer in this province is a product of its tremendous altitudinal variance from the country's highest peaks to its coastal position on the beautiful eastern seaboard, from mangrove fringed estuaries to the peaks of the Drakensberg Mountains, from cool mistbelt forests of the Midlands to the subtropical forests of Maputi land. KwaZulu Natal offers some of the best birding on the African continent. Its world famous birding sites provide forest, grassland, wetland, bushveld, mountain, estuarine, seashore, and marine habitats and the great multitude of species that rely on them. Just appreciate the fantastic selection of habitats and species on this list. So KwaZulu Natal's top 14 bird species. Why 14? Well, because 10 are simply inadequate for this province. They are green barbet, southern banded snake eagle, rosy throated longclaw, green malcoa, near guard sunbird, woodwards batis, blue swallow, Eastern bronze nape pigeon, swamp nightjar, bearded vulture, palm nut vulture, Livingston's turaco, spotted ground thrush, and plain back sunbird. The first six birds on that list are only found within KwaZulu Natal within South Africa. And many of the others are critically endangered or endangered species sub in the subregion. So, what are the prime hotspots and key sites? To visit while birding this amazing province. Well, with a bird list totaling 457 species over an area of only 40,000 hectares, which is a minuscule 2% of the size of the Kruger National Park. I mean, can you believe that? It is no wonder that Mkuzi Game Reserve is considered the holy grail for Southern African birders. This comparatively tiny reserve caters to an exceptional 53% of the country's bird species. Seriously, just absorb that for a second. This 108-year-old rough diamond, which also hosts the Big Five, forms part of the Greater Isimangalisa Wetland Park and is an affordable public reserve. 
Adjacent to it lies another gem, the 28,500 hectare Pinda Private Game Reserve Complex, which caters to many of the same species, but in the lap of luxury. Very near, we find the rest of the East Mangalisa Wetland Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is on trade to a species list exceeding 380 birds. And it is here that we encounter some superb shorebirds, estuarine, lake, coastal forest, and coastal grassland specials, as well as many large and small terrestrial and marine mammals, and many other treats that grace this province's coastline. There is very good reason that this park's name means miracle and wonder. A great private reserve that we also visit adjacent to this park is Bonamanzi, which overlooks False Bay. A little further north lies four other areas well worth exploring. These include Ndumu Game Reserve, Tembi Elephant Park, Cozy Bay and Pongola Game Reserve on the shores of Lake Tazini. These reserves are spread across the subtropical coastal, coastal plain and the lower reaches of some large river systems which border both Eswatini and Mozambique. It is in these reserves that you'll discover nine of KZN's and South Africa's most sought after species, namely the Southern Banner Snake Eagle, Rosy Throated Longclaw, Green Malcoa, Neogod Sunbird, Woodwoods Batis, Swamp Nightjar, palm nut vulture, Livingston's Turaco, and plenty more. Another great res or public reserve offering fantastic savanna and woodland species in particular is the world-renowned Shishlui and Fulosi Park. Famed for its legendary rhino conservation and the Big Five, this great public reserve, when combined with the adjacent private reserves such as Manyoni, Zamanga, and Tanda, provide entree to an excess of 400 bushveld species. And the targets will include whiteback night heron, African finfoot saddlebilled stork, southern bald ibis, and several more. We then visit Glinza Forest, Ungoya Forest, into Many Forest, and Umlalazi, which are a little further south toward Durban, in search of exceptional birds such as green barbet. Eastern bronze snake pigeon, palm nut vulture, spotted ground thrush, black kukul, black rump button quail, and mangrove kingfisher. Here we also connect with two great local community bird guides, being Sakamushlium Shlongo and Junior Gabela, who always have current knowledge of the specials and their hideouts in these locations. From here, another great area to explore is the altitudinal grasslands, wetlands, and forests of the Kark Reef, where target species include the stately blue, wattled, and grey crowned cranes, forest buzzards, the elusive orange ground thrush, and many more. The perfect connection to Kark Reef is to progress on through the midlands towards the foothills of a, another UNESCO World Heritage Site the breathtaking Malorti Drakenberg Park, in search of a few of South Africa's rarest and most endangered species, being the blue swallow, the Cape Spar Parrot, and Southern Bald Ibis. Then, to press on up the famed Sani Pass, or on to the Giant's Castle, into the Afro-Alpine grasslands, in search of the glorious bearded vulture, ground woodpecker, Drakensberg rock jumper, Drakensberg Siskin, Gurney Sugarbird, Mountain Pippet, and several other species. There are also so many other delightful birds in great size to mention, such as the Itala Game Reserve, Crichton Valley, Umtumvuna River, the Oribe Gorge, and the Freyheit area. Unfortunately, time just does not permit us uh, exploring this. So when tying this all together into a signal route, we would visit most or all of these fantastic sites, which would garner well in the excess of 350 species over a seven or eight day trip. Trips would either depart from and return to Durban, or alternatively, you'll add extensions up towards the 
moist grasslands and, and wetlands of the um, Vacostrum area or through Eswatini into Southern Kruger or up into Golden Gate in the Free State. Sustained KwaZulu Natal birding tours often combine these amazing birding areas with several big wildlife habitats as well, which offer superb game view. We undertake birding on foot, by vehicle, by boat, on rivers, lakes, and the sea, by four by four, and with community bird guides. And on our birding tours, naturally the spectacular birds are always the main event. But if you're also keen on other wildlife, so butterflies, frogs, breathtaking landscapes, and other biodiversity, you'll gladly pause to enjoy these with you too as we have a great love and appreciation for them as well. And KwaZulu-Natal offers them in great abundance. Occasionally, we will also schedule a tour that will include a pelagic birding trip from Durban, which could add an additional 30 odd bird species to your list as well, um, as to date 49 species have been recorded off our coast. So when selecting the prime birding destinations to visit in Southern Africa, any serious birder should prioritize booking a tour to the exceptional KwaZulu-Natal province. There is little dispute that it offers the greatest birding, wildlife and landscape prospects in the sub-region. Here are Sustain's five upcoming tours, which include KwaZulu-Natal and the itineraries. And we would encourage you to go onto our website, sustainsafaris.com and to download the trip guides and itineraries and to get hold of us in regards to these tours. I hope they are of great interest to you and we'd love to welcome you and guide you through this spectacular region. So another great and important announcement which is very exciting for us is that Sustain will be partnering with one of Southern Africa's greatest ever golfers, the world-renowned Mark McNulty who is also an avid birder and photographer. In a new related business venture we'll be forming, which will launch golf, birding, wildlife and photography tours that focus on the Southern African region. This company will be launched in October and today we are unveiling its brand for the very first time. The company will be called Double Eagle and here is our very meaningful logo. And soon our website, which is www.doubleeagle.tours, will be going live. So please watch this space. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, we trust you have a great birding fair and you learn a lot. We trust you have enjoyed this talk and get hold of us for one of our tours. Keep well, God bless, and take care. Thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Neil Perrins. Welcome to this brief presentation on the pelagic free run of Dur Durban Harbour. I did my first pelagic out of there in July 2009. One of the main targets in those days was flesh-footed shearwater, which is more common off the east coast than it is in the Cape waters. The, the pelagic used to get run in winter months, mainly in June and July. Since that, we've decided to expand the offering and go out in different months and see what else we could find out there. And it's been eye-opening, I must say. Often one of the first questions I get asked is when is best to go? My answer is always that there is no best time. The majority of pelagic birds breed in summer, which means the adults move south to their breeding islands. This leaves less birds in the area, so there won't be much of a frenzy around, around the boat as there is in the winter of uh, pelagic. However, in the summer, the northern hemisphere birds migrate south, giving us a range of different species to look out for, such as European storm petrel, the jagers, as well as specials like red-footed booby and best passage migrants like black-bellied storm petrel. The bird in the photo is a flesh for the shearwater, showing its why, where it gets its name from. Two of the most common birds we get off Durban are white chin petrel and uh, Indian yellow-nosed albatross. This is a white chin petrel. As you can see, it's got that cream-coloured bill and a little white chin. Uh, it's a fairly big petrel. They breed on the sub-Antarctic islands from South Georgia right across to New Zealand regular year round, but the numbers increase in the winter. This is an Indian yellow-nosed albatross. 
So side adults on the left and uh, adults on the right with the yellow ridge on the top of the bill and the red tip to the bill. The youngsters getting the yellow you can just see starting on the top of the tip. They breed in the subantarctic islands in the Indian Ocean from Prince Edwards across to Amsterdam Island. They are regular year round but again numbers increase in winter. This is one of the larger species we see of, of Durban pelagics, uh, shy albatross. We get them in low numbers usually in the winter. Um, majority are the younger birds, which tend to range much more widely than the adults do. This is a black browed albatross. Again, they're around in lower numbers, usually in winter, and we've only ever seen immature birds off Durban. Um, the adult birds are quite common down in the Cape. The young birds have quite dark underwings with that uh, paler middle, middle feathers. And they usually show a grey collar as this individual does. That bill will lighten up as it gets older, it'll finally become orangey yellow with a red tip. Brown or subantarctic skewers. Our birds come from the Marian Island population, the long, long bogey race. They're regular in winter, they hang around feeding flocks and steal tippets where they can, whenever they're given a chance. Uh, we've had one come so close to the boat that we managed to photograph the ring and that proved that it was from the Marian, Marian Island birds. Our other winter regulars, um, as we've done more pelagics, we've started to get things like northern giant petrel, southern giant petrel and Antarctic prime, which until that point were thought to be um, KZN rarities. So we, we've persuaded the KZN rarities committee that we're not doing reports on every prime we see and every giant petrel we see. Winter rarities. One of our best encounters uh, was this young city albatross, affectionately known as Black Betty. My friend Richard Everett and I have always joked about seeing Black Betty off, off of Durban, knowing that it seldom comes north of 40 degrees south. The scientific name Phoebetria fusca has been simplified to Black Betty mainly by the fishermen. So a song by Ram Jam of the same name become popular between the two of us. One June, as the action was dying down, we were about to head back to Durban Harbour. This pointy-tailed, thin-winged, brownish albatross flew over the, over the boat, and all three of us guiding the trip stared in amazement. Sooty albatross! Rich went ape, dancing around the, around the deck, singing a very bad rendition of Black Betty. The bird club members thought we'd absolutely lost our minds. But what a great day out that was. Winter rarities include wandering albatross which you've seen twice but that can pitch up at any time of the year due to its name it's a wanderer the young birds especially um, have very wide ranges atlantic yellow-nosed albatross uh, not known to come th this far north that breeds on, on um, in the atlantic ocean as its name says um, and we've now had three three different occasions when we've seen a atlantic yellow-nosed off durban so they are starting to move a little bit more Cape petrel, Pintado petrel, very striking little bird, very common off the Cape in the winter. Uh, we get a few stragglers coming up the east coast, they don't normally come that, that far up, but we sort of get one or two every winter. This white-faced storm petrel in the photograph, we actually saw two of them on the same, same pelagic where we saw the city albatross. They, they seem to be around in May and June, we've had two trips now where we found them. Slenderball prion, uh, you always searching through like the sesticulars of the sea, um, you're looking at the prions and trying to pick out the tiny features of differences that you, you have to look at to, to identify them. We've had two trips with Slenderball prions being picked out of the, of the groups. Antarctic tern has also started to pitch up off our pelagics, um, the bulkier tern and then common Antarctic tern. Um, and in the winter we, we've been picking up a couple of them now. And summer regulars. Great winged petrel is one of the few pelagic species to breed in the winter. Um, our birds come from the Marian Island population. They become particularly abundant in the summer. Um, some of the younger birds um, tend to stay over winter as well. So we get them year round, but big numbers in the summer. This is a, quite a tatty bird. You can see it's molting, it's regrowing some of its feathers. And these are known as gadfly petrels, the group of pterodromas and a couple of other species. This is one of the pterodroma genus. 
They have rel relatively narrow wings and rely on strong wind to fly dynamically. You can usually pick them up from quite a distance from their arcing flight. Other summer regulars, uh, soft plumage petrel, we get from July through to September. Uh, Cory shearwater comes to us from the Northern Hemisphere. We get small numbers of them in, in uh, the summer months. European storm petrel varies from year to year, but we always have a few of them coming down. One May, we head up to a thousand coming into our chum slick. Parasitic Jago is a, a fairly regular visitor. We get one or two on our, our summer pelagics. Great Crested Tern is resident and breeds, breeds off our coastline. Um, we have them year round, but the numbers pick up in summer. Lesser Crested Tern comes down to us from, from the east and um, sort of late, late autumn through to, um, through to the end of summer, we, we pick up numbers, especially in the harbour. Common Tern and Arctic Tern come to us again from the north. Um, common Tern is very numerous in summer. Arctic turn, we get a couple of individuals on, on most of our summer trips. One of our super specials, um, it only breeds on the high reaches of Reunion Island. In pre and post breeding, they do a huge arc out to our coastal waters. The, I was chatting to Barry Rose on, a, on a, one of the Cape Pelagics, and he gave me some pointers of where, where to look. So in 2013, I was looking at the contours of the ocean floor and I picked out a point where I thought it would be pretty good to, to position ourselves. And we went there with the boat and waited. We got there. David said, right, we're here. You recognize it? So I said, well, let's just wait. So we sat and we waited. About 10 minutes later, in bombed this Barrows Petrel. What a stunning bird to see. It still needs a lot of luck as they really are low in numbers. They're a highly endangered bird. But we try and go out every October and November to, to see if we can add it to, our, to some of our lucky Pelagicos lists. Some of the other specials that we have had, we've had red foot of booby on two of our trips. Grey petrel seems to pitch up in the, in the summer for some reason, um, we've had it on two of our trips. Great shear water is an irregular visitor, but we do get it coming into our waters some years. Tropical shearwater, a special of the East Coast. Uh, we've had it on three of our trips, a stunning little black and white shearwater. black belly storm petrel, as I said earlier, is a, a passage migrant, so we get it sort of um, early autumn and then spring through to early summer. Sabine's gull, we've only had one individual seen at the more, hangs more around the cave waters. We've had one immature pitch up in, in the summer pelagic. Sooty tern, in some years it erupts in big numbers. We've had hundreds of them. Off the, outside the harbour. Um, other years you get one or two pelagics where you see them, but we're always looking out for a black and white turn out there. Long-tailed jager, it um, comes, comes to us in summer. We've had them as late as May. We had six individuals heading rapidly north, all in full breeding plumage, really good to see. Then there's the unexpected. We were out on a November pelagic uh, where our target was Barrow's Petrel. Unfortunately, that didn't appear, but it got trumped by South Africa's first record of Tahiti Petrel. And it was Southern Africa's first photographically confirmed record of Tahiti Petrel. So it goes to show, you just never know what can pitch up out in the open oceans. And then of course, being out in the ocean is not just the birds. We, on the, the same Tahiti Petrel project, this Mako shark came and stole our chum. And We've seen several species of dolphin. We've had spinner, spotted, humpback, common and bottlenose dolphins out there. We've had a false killer whale with a bottlenose. We've had humpback whales regularly um, as they travel north and south in, in the start of winter and end of winter. We've had different types of sharks. We've had spinner sharks jumping out behind the boat. Really amazing to see this macro shark and then a few unidentified fins that have come up near our chum. Um, sunfish, we, we get it a sort of summertime, we, we often see them large, mola mola as its other name is. And then one pelagic, we had a great, great sight of a manta ray jumping about 50 meters off the boat, really good to see. And the, the questions I often get asked, um, obviously what is the cost? In 2020, the price of fuel has gone up a little bit, but we've kept, we've kept the price to 17.50 a person. How long does the trip take? 
generally is about eight hours. We depart at first lights and return around about two o'clock. What is the boat like? We use a twin hull vessel at the moment, which is quite stable and has downstairs and upstairs seating. A can to store your gear and food. There's a cash bar on board where various drinks can be bought. We just ask that people bring their own food that they want to eat. We find that some people do eat and some people don't want to eat. And then coffee is available just before we go out. There's a toilet on board, but it's best to make use of the facilities as the wharf prior to departure. Those toilets are quite little and pokey. Will you get sick? Well, that's difficult to answer. And in my experience, the best, to, best way to, to stop it is to take some form of motion sickness prevention. It's best to get a doctor's advice, a mixture of medicines such as Stugeron, Valoids, or Epinutin if you get it on prescription, maybe what you need to, to, to stop feeling woozy up there. A backup day, well, we don't own the boat, so we can't demand that they keep the boat for two days, otherwise we'd have to pay for it. But we endeavor to have the Sunday as a backup day, so if, if the boat is available, we'll always be in the hands of the weather and the skipper will only take us out if he deems it safe to do so. The safety on board, the boat has, has an inflatable lifeboat, life jackets, and is in communication with the port by radio. Obviously, the normal first aid items are on board. Uh, my contact details are here, neilafustedsbirding.ca.za. Um, the details of the trips are on my website as shown there. And then there's a link there as well to show you what species occur and when, in which months we've seen them. So thank you all for your time, for listening. And I hope to see you all down there in the deep blue ocean. Welcome everyone to our presentation about Cape Town Pelagics. I'm Vincent Ward and I invite you to sit back while we take you on a virtual pelagic trip. Before we set sail, I would like to tell you a little bit about us. Cape Town Pelagics has been running trips off the South African coast for over two decades. We're also a proudly recognized BirdLife South Africa bird friendly company. Cape Town Pelagics is run as a non-profit company. All of our profits are channeled back into various conservation projects. In the past few years, we have donated over 100,000 rand towards various conservation projects like BirdLife International's Save the Albatross campaign, as well as the Albatross Task Force. We also support the Sand Carb Seabird Rehabilitation Center by helping with seabird releases. So let us dive into the details of a typical pelagic. Two days are reserved for each of our trips, which allows us to go out to sea in the best possible weather conditions. Ultimately, we leave this very important safety decision to our experienced skippers. On our trips, we use one of several fast ski boats. Each is equipped with an onboard toilet, as well as plenty of stowage for your camera gear and other optics. Snacks, drinks, and a light lunch are provided during the course of the day. With all of the essential details handled, we can now start our trip. Most of our trips leave from Simonstown. This historic port has played host to many famous figures like Captain Cook, Charles Darwin, and of course, just nuisance. Once safety on board, we do a safety briefing. We are also currently following recommended COVID-19 health guidelines. After casting off our mooring lines, we leave the harbour and pass the historic South African Navy Yard. In the winter months, we are treated to the sun rising over the Koffelberg Mountains. Heading south, we have the famous Boulders Beach penguin colony on our starboard side. We often encounter small rafts of African penguins just offshore. False Bay is famed for its marine mammal sightings long beak common dolphins can occasionally be seen in large pods numbering several thousand. Good numbers of southern right whales are present from July through to November. The calm waters of the bay are a haven for several endemic coastal seabirds. These include Cape Gannets as well as both crowned and Cape Cormorants. Heartlubs and kelp gulls as well as swift terns are almost always seen on our way out. In less than 30 minutes, we have reached the world famous Cape Point and nearby Cape of Good Hope. After a quick photo stop, we set course for the productive fishing grounds known as the Cape Canyon. 
Once past Cape Point, we start to see our first true pelagic species, such as white chin petrel. To give you an idea of the likelihood of seeing a particular species, in this talk we have provided a color-coded key. This ranges from red, which indicates a very low probability of a bird being seen, to high, which is indicated by yellow. Several species of shearwaters are encountered very close to the coast. Great shearwaters are common from October to May. Cory shearwaters arrive slightly later, having completed a very long journey from the North Atlantic and their breeding grounds in the Mediterranean. As we head into deeper oceanic waters, we begin to encounter our first albatrosses. Shy albatross is the most common albatross we encounter on our trips. The aptly named black browed albatross is the next most commonly seen albatross species. With some luck, we will reach a working trawler. They usually operate 30 to 40 kilometers offshore, and we can usually reach them in less than two hours travel from Cape Point. Occasionally, we only find longliners. In cases where no fishing vessels are out at sea, we use either oil or chum to attract birds to our boat. Once at a vessel, your guide works hard to identify the various species hidden within this mass of birds. Species we hope to find include the endangered Indian yellownose albatross. The presence of a grey head separates the equally endangered Atlantic yellownose albatross from its Indian counterpart. There are also good chances of finding both of the giant petrel. Southern giant petrel is characterized by having a pale green bill tip. The very similar northern giant petrel has a contrasting red bill tip. These features can, however, be tricky to see at longer distances. Brown skua is also common at fishing vessels. They can be confiding at times, swimming up to our boat, hoping for a free meal. Storm petrels are attracted to the fish oil released from fish being processed by these vessels. Wilson storm petrels can occur throughout the year. European storm petrels are absent in midwinter. Spectacle petrels are amongst the most highly sought after species on our trips. Once rare, this distinctive seabird is now more common, especially in the summer months. It is thought that the hard work done protecting their breeding colonies are responsible for this increasing occurrence. Other summer migrants include the three Jaeger species which are parasitic, pomeran, and long-tailed. These three species are kleptoparasites, meaning that they steal prey from other seabirds, especially the terns. The stunning Sabines gulls trek to our shores from their breeding grounds in the high Arctic of Canada and Northern Europe. The distinctive tricolored M on their upper wings and their fluffy flights help them to stand out from the other gulls. Summer is also a good time for tropical species such as flesh footed shearwater. Switching seasons, the most striking of our winter specials is the handsome Cape or Pintado petrel, which is Cape Town Pelagic's mascot bird. Some of our winter trips have recorded up to several thousand Pintados behind a single trawler. A fun bit of trivia is that the scientific name for the species, Dapsian, is an anagram of the word pintado. Antarctic prions are another winter bird that can occasionally be seen in very large numbers. Several other prions have been recorded off the South African coast, but these are all currently considered vagrants. Southern fulmers are sporadic, ranging from being uncommon to completely absent in some years. Black-bellied storm petrel is a passage migrant passing our coast in May and then again in early summer. The most sought after group of seabirds on our trips are the great albatrosses. Most common are the two royal albatrosses. Northern royal is the most commonly recorded of the two species. Southern royal was once considered a rare vagrant, but is now seen annually. Occasionally, multiple birds can be seen at a single trawler. The legendary wandering albatross, the largest living seabird species, used to be regular but is now a rare sight. Changes in fishing activities down in the sub-Antarctic are believed to have played a role in shifting their distribution. 
I'm particularly fond of this particular photo as it shows both the largest seabird, the wandering albatross, along with the smallest, Wilson's, at the bottom of the photo. Our recent 2019 trips turned up several rarities like this juvenile light mantle albatross. An adult Sullivan's albatross was also a huge surprise in one of our 2019 trips. After several hours of productive seabirding, we start the run back at midday, possibly finding humpback whales along the way. Once back in False Bay, we stop for a light lunch. On more than one occasion, our meal has been interrupted by a passing pod of dolphins. Our Simonstown departures visit the Bank Cormorant Colony at Partridge Point, before safely returning to port by mid-afternoon. Safely back in port, we go over the species list, which typically totals 25 or more species depending on the season. I hope you have enjoyed this sneak peek into what a trip is like. I would like to thank some of my fellow guides, Dalton Gibbs, David Swanepoel, Mayor Prague, and the late Barry Rose for sharing some of their photos. If you would like further details on our trips, please visit our webpage or you can email Amanda directly. If you would like something to do on your alternate day, we're happy to book a terrestrial birding day trip for you. Please follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you for watching and we hope to welcome you on board very soon. A massive thank you to Duncan, Michael, Dominic, Neil, and Vince for those very descriptive and informative talks. South Africa has a lot to offer, and it was plainly clear that birds are not the only attraction when traveling through our beautiful country. Coming up in just a few minutes on this channel are some presentations from BirdLife South Africa's NGO partners who work on birds, including the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, and SANCOG, the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Seabirds. At the main feeder, we have an international panel discussion on COVID-19 and the effect that the pandemic has had on birds, conservation and AV tourism. This will be led by the CEO of BirdLife International, Patricia Zarita, as well as the father of the British Bird Fair and indeed all bird fairs, Tim Appleton, and Rock Jumper Birding Tours Director, Adam Riley. On feeder three, Mark Anderson leads a panel of local bird club committee members to showcase what our bird clubs do and why you should join your local bird club. Enjoy it.